Okay, good morning. This is William Barnard. I teach the Horizon Sunday School class with two other teachers on a regular basis. This morning is Sunday, December the 13th, and our lesson is uh, one on uh, from Mark. It's still in the first chapter of Mark, uh, the ninth through the um, 15th verse. And normally in our Sunday School class, we usually take uh, prayer request first, and since this is a virtual thing, I just know that we have many people in our church and some uh, some of our church staff right now that are still dealing with COVID issues, and I just ask that you be in prayer for them and to continue thinking about that and pray for a safe delivery of the um, COVID vaccine once it's approved and that people, enough people will take it to make a difference and that early middle of next year, then things will find itself back to something that might be a new normal. So we'll see what that's going to be. But uh, just ask that you think about those in your lives right now that need special prayers. I have a friend who has a brother that just had emergency surgery yesterday and they've been in my prayers. And so I'd like to start the lesson this morning with a prayer. Uh, that will be a universal type prayer, but I wish that uh, you would pray with me at this time and think of those people that you are associated with that need special thoughts. Let's pray together. Our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to be able to come to you when we need you and we need your touch and your spirit. We ask that you just be with the people in our lives that are suffering right now so much and so much difficulty and so much pain, so much anxiety and so much fear, and in some case, physical needs as well. You know who they are so much better than we, and you know exactly what they need. So we just give them to you and we ask that you be with them and that you will watch over them during this difficult time in their lives and in our world, that they will be blessed and become healthy once again. We ask that you watch over us and keep us safe, be with those in authority above us, that uh, they will make good decisions following your lead and your example of your son. We ask all these things in your son's name. Amen. Today, last week, we talked a little bit about Mark, the very first chapter. Uh, Mark was writing a letter to the Romans. The Romans liked something with a lot of action, so they liked kind of like action type heroes, and they were looking for a for a story. And when we think that Mark was the first gospel writer, most most of the theologians think that Mark wrote his letter first, and that many of the other the other three gospel writers wrote a lot from his writings. But Mark left a lot of a lot of stuff out. And we'll talk about that as we go through this uh, today. But today the, the lessons talks about uh, the, uh, the ministry begins. And this is lesson two. It's lesson two in our new book. If you haven't gotten it, this is uh, the remarkable uh, journey begins. And it, it talks about uh, in Mark about Jesus but Jesus doesn't, I mean, Mark doesn't start with a, a birth of narrative. He, he starts kind of in the middle. And so um, the main idea of this lesson is when I face temptation, God always gives me a way out. And we're going to try to explore that a little bit. The lesson didn't talk a great deal about temptation, um, but it did talk about what led up to Jesus's temptation and what took place uh, in a short story narrative type situation. The question to is to explore is how do I resist temptation? We as Christians are tempted all the time. We, we are tempted to take the easy way out to do the things that we think are simple, the things that will cost us the least amount of our time or the least amount of our money. And we just don't always consider what the temptation is doing to us. The study aim of this lesson is to understand that sometimes after I experience my greatest spiritual victories, I am immediately faced with my greatest spiritual challenges. And if we think about our uh, excellent example of Jesus, that's exactly what happened to him. His greatest spiritual achievement uh, being announced as the son of God was followed by 40 days in the wilderness and the temptation of Satan. In the quick read, it says, in the river, Jesus experienced the blessing of baptism. 
the voice of God and the Holy Spirit. But then the same spirit immediately led him away to the wilderness to be tempted, just as I said. So let's read Mark 1, 9 through 15. If you have your Bibles, please turn there. If you don't, you can follow along in the quarterly. If you have it, it's on page 28 of our quarterly. It says, at that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. At once, the spirit sent him into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and the angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of the gospel. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near repent and believe the good news. And the author of our lesson has been a pastor for a long time. And he, he mentions in the, in his introduction that he had been a pastor for 33 years, a lead pastor for 33 years. And he got the question all the time about how long have you been a pastor? And he always thought about how to answer that question. Um, was it, did, did it start at the time that he became the lead pastor? Did it start at the time that he preached his first sermon as a youth minister? Did it start at the time that he got his first job in a church? And he, he, he comments about each one of those. When does your ministry start? And what the pastor felt like was the right answer was he felt like the moment that he was baptized and received the Holy Spirit that his ministry started. So in his case, the ministry started at 11 years old. And we're going to explore that today with this lesson. When did your ministry start? Those of us that are in regular jobs, not, not church jobs or anything like that, uh, when we're asked, when did your ministry start? We look at everybody with a strange look on our, their, our face, and, and, and we're trying to figure out what are, they, what are they saying. But hopefully by the time we get through with the lesson, we will discover that once we were baptized, our ministry started. And for many of us, we haven't dealt with that the way that God would like for us to um, put it in the first part of our, our forefront of our lives. So the author was asked that, and he said, I was baptized at 11 years old, and that's when my ministry started. Well, we know that in the Bible, according to Mark, I mean, Mark, Mark leaves out a whole bunch of stuff, and we'll talk about that too when we get to it. But uh, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan River. That is in verse 9 of the first chapter of Mark. A whole bunch of stuff was left out that the other ones um, mentioned. But Mark begins with John the Baptist. And Jesus was baptized and sent into the wilderness, and then he began his ministry. Mark doesn't begin with the birth of Jesus. Mark leaves that out. People have asked questions about that, and we don't have Mark to ask now as to, you know, why did he leave that out? It, we don't, it doesn't talk about Galilee. It doesn't talk about the birth of Jesus. There's no manger. There's no shepherds. There's no wise men. There's no angels. There's nothing about being born in a manger. And my question is, why? And if we were all together, I would love to hear the conversation that we were, we would have. But I want you to concentrate on that for just a minute. Wonder why Mark starts with this being the beginning of the story. He doesn't, we will find out later in Mark, Mark will mention that Jesus was a carpenter. Mark will mention that Jesus had a family and his family members will be named Mary and Joseph and uh, brothers and, 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 and such. Uh, but that doesn't happen until chapter six of Mark. And I wonder why that wasn't necessary in Mark's mind to lead up to that. When, when we introduce somebody or when we have to introduce somebody, we like to have a little biography about them and tell a little bit about that. When I've been a, a speaker and, and uh, was going to make a presentation in front of a group of people, there was always a little bio that they requested of me and said, you know, what's your background? Why are you here? You know, wh what is it that you're doing? And uh, Mark 
doesn't give us a whole lot of that. But what he does give us is that uh, he was writing a letter to the Romans and the Romans just liked the facts and they liked it short and it's sweet. <clears throat> and just like the things that were important. So we have to figure out that Mark was writing to a specific group of people that didn't need to have the full details. And for whatever reason, he let them out, left them out. But Mark 6 does mention that Jesus was a carpenter and he mentions a family, like I said. So it says that he came from Galilee and he was baptized in the Jordan. Well, again, Mark leaves out a whole bunch of stuff. Why is the Jordan River so important? Uh, in this part of the world, you know, in, in 2020, as bad as things have been this year, I can still go to the sink and turn on a faucet and water comes out. Uh, in biblical times, you had to go to the river and that water was the thing that drew people together. And the Jordan River was very, very special. It's filled with stories throughout the Bible but that water brings life and we have to have water. That's the one thing that we do have to have. We don't always have to have food, but we do have to have water. So water brings life, but the Jordan River starts at Mount Hermon, uh, over a thousand feet in elevation uh, above sea level. And it flows for miles and miles and miles all the way to the Dead Sea, which is 1300 feet below sea level. So it descends 2300 feet. But it's not just that. Think about all the stories of the Bible that deal with the Jordan River. If you go back, the Jordan River took a major role in the life of Abram, who became Abraham. It's in the story of Lot. It's in the story of Joshua. It's in the story of Elijah. It's in the story of Elisha. And when the promise, when the, the Jews came to the promised land, they had to cross the Jordan River. It is very prominent throughout all of scripture because it is the lifeblood of all, all the life where they lived. So my question is, why does, one of the questions that I, I have mentally for me is why did Jesus go to John? John's out in the desert. We, we talked about him last week. He's wearing a coat of camel hair. He has a leather belt. The other person in the Bible that was important, that was supposed to be a spokesman that would come before Jesus and herald him in, also wore a camel or a hair coat and a uh, leather belt, and that was Elijah. And a lot of people liken John to being Elijah. He was the voice of the one crying in the wilderness, and he was preparing a straight path. We talked about in our Sunday school class last week when the Roman emperors were getting ready to go on a trip, they sent an envoy out ahead of them and they made the roads smoother. So they weren't bumpy. The roads were repaired. The roads were made straight rather than so curvy to where it just took a long time to get to certain places. So the Bible is filled with things that were referred to at that particular time. Make the path straight, make that way easy to travel. And that's what this was about. But why did Jesus go to John? Did Jesus need to be baptized? Um, there's a lot of, lot of people that would say, absolutely, he had to be baptized. Um, there's a lot of people saying, no, he's the son of God. What, what, what's that going to add? So we're going to explore that. If we were together, I'd love to hear the discussion that we would have. But... Uh, I just want you to think about that. Why did Jesus go to be with John? The author of the lesson said a few things that, that may be correct, and it might be something that you're thinking about, but it may be something that we've missed. But Jesus wanted to be identified with John's, John's ministries. You have to realize they're cousins, uh, that Mary and Sarah were, were related, and that these guys were cousins. Did they grow up together? Did they know each other? Did they speak? you know, spend any time together? We, we don't know. We don't know the answer to that. But Jesus, by going to John, Jesus would complete John's work. John had always said, there's going to be somebody that's going to come and baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And he's going to do that. So, and I am so unworthy that I cannot loosen the thongs of his sandals. But what do we, you know, J Jesus comes to John 
And John says, you need to baptize me. And Jesus says, no, I want you to baptize me. And Jesus enters into the water. Now, here's something that could be a, a, a three-week conversation. The word baptism means to pour or to dip. But Mark says in his scripture that Jesus came up out of the water. When Jesus came up out of the water, that makes us think as Baptists that he was immersed, but we don't know. But baptism by itself means dipped. There was a precedent going on in Roman times that when the Judaizers were out there, the ones that said to be a Christian, you had to become a Jew first. And they would actually, the Jews would baptize Gentiles that wanted to become Jewish so they could become Christian. So baptism was there, but John is in the wilderness and he's preaching, you've got to repent. You have got to turn around. You have got to go a different way. And he's very bold and very specific. And he puts down the authorities that are there. He calls them a brood of vipers. And, and, John just is very adamant that you have to repent and you have to do this and you have to do that and you have to make a change. And then once you change, then you have to confess your sins. Well, most people don't want to confess their sins. They say it is uh, very uplifting to those that have carried a heavy burden and a heavy weight for a long period of time. But most people don't want other people to know what they think and what they thought when it was the wrong thing to do. But John baptizes Jesus. And when, and we know what happens from scripture, the heavens tear open and there is a physical presence of a Holy spirit descending onto Jesus as a dove, which was described in, in the scriptures, and then also something else that happened that did not happen very often. Everyone present heard the voice of God. God spoke and said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And, John, and Mark only mentions that by passing. It says, uh, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove and a voice came from heaven. You're and, and, and said just what I said, but that, that's all he says. It just says a voice came from heaven. Well, he doesn't mention in his scriptures that it was from God or anything else. So I'm curious again, why does Mark just tell this short story in this form? But we do know that when Jesus came out of the water, his ministry began. Uh, when his baptism was over, his ministry started. He used to be a carpenter, now he's a minister, and now he is the proclaimed son of God. What do we know about John the Baptist after his baptism of Jesus? We know that very shortly after that, Jesus goes into the wilderness for 40 days. When he comes out, or shortly thereafter, John the Baptist has already been arrested, and we know what happens to John when he's put to death. Uh, but John's ministry was over at that point in time. And Jesus is the fulfillment of what God was having to do, what God was at work doing. Jesus, I mean, God sent John the Baptist to be the proclaimer, and Jesus gave him support by letting him be the fulfillment of that uh, proclamation. Um, Why did Jesus need to be baptized? John the Baptist asked this himself. He says, and Jesus responded, I need to be baptized to do this to fulfill all righteousness. So Jesus is, re is referring to scripture. This is what he's saying is I am fulfilling scripture and I need to do this and you need to do it for me. Jesus joined with others who had been baptized, the people that were baptized right before and right after Jesus. I don't know how many people ran down to the water after Jesus came out of the water. We never have a story about that. But if I'd seen heaven open and heard God, I'd have been in the water. And I just think that there would have been a time when um, it was important for uh many people to to respond to John and to repent. But John says that Jesus was going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. So Jesus joined with others that had been baptized. He joins with us 
when we're baptized or we join with him, Jesus is identifying with the people that he came to save. Jesus didn't have to be baptized, but he's leading by example and he's telling us that's what he wants us to do. Uh, baptism is a new life. Jesus's life changed the day he was baptized. Was he special before? Yes, we know he made water into wine at his mother's request before he was ready to start his ministry. But that's one of the few things that we know about that he did with special powers uh, before his ministry started. And Jesus didn't go around flaunting his special powers. He went around using his special powers to uh, preach and teach that there was gonna be an everlasting life. So his public ministry started. He changed from a carpenter to a minister. At our baptism, what happened? Um, I always jokingly said, Dr. Campbell, Frank Campbell, years ago held me for down for a long time to make sure that uh, it took. Uh, that may not have been true, uh, but uh, it was one of the things that uh, when I came up out of the water, I did feel different and that there was a difference in my life. At the age that I am right now, I'm kind of horrified to find out that my ministry might have begun when I was 10 years old and I was baptized at First Baptist Church. And to think about all the wasted time that I had in my ministry when I was trying to uh, take care of myself and make myself into whatever it was I was going to be. Um, if our ministry truly starts then, then we might need to make up for lost time. But our, baptize, our baptism signaled that our lives had changed. And my question to you today is, how did your life change when you were baptized? Did you go back the next day and do the same thing you did the day before? Uh, were you different? Were you a different instrument? Were you, did it take you years to understand what the baptism meant? And it took you years to realize that you had a ministry. Um, do some of us yet not know that we have a ministry and how we were doing? Are we changed? How did we change? How, how, you know, the, the, I did not hear the voice of God come down from heaven and everybody in the church that day hear it. I uh, did not see the Holy Spirit descend on me as a dove. But we know that that was a special thing for Jesus, the Son of God. It wasn't meant for us, but we joined Jesus in our own baptism, and that's how we um, can make things work in our lives. But just as Jesus led by example, his ministry started when he came up out of the water. And that's when our ministry has started. So if we've been baptized, we're in the middle of our ministry right now. And maybe we should reassess our lives from time to time to think, this is, this is, this is part of my ministry. God put me at this place at this time to do these things. And I'm always horrified to think after the fact that I might have missed an opportunity here or I might have missed an opportunity there. I was lazy. I didn't, I didn't look at the person on the street as much as I should have. I walked around them rather than conversing with them. I, I, I did things that I might be ashamed of and I did them un, unknowingly that I was in a ministerial position and, and didn't follow that particular calling. Um, our baptism singled that our, signaled that our lives had changed. And then I wanna know how did it change? How are you changed? We were taking an oath and our ministry began at that time. Uh, how was Jesus's baptism different from all others? And we've already talked about that, but the Holy Spirit came down and God spoke. The Holy Spirit comes to us when we have the baptism. Sometimes we don't make a very, very big room in our lives for the Holy Spirit. Sometimes our, our rooms are wide open and the Holy Spirit fills a big part of us. And there's people that we know that I'm absolutely certain carry the Holy Spirit with them every day. Uh, there are other peoples uh, that I'm pretty sure they've pretty much got baptized and they've closed the door yet they don't realize that there's a ministry there and they've given the Holy Spirit a very, very small place. Um, most of us fall somewhere in the middle between those two categories. But 
we have the Holy Spirit within us. It's that little voice inside of our head sometimes that tells us that this is the right thing that we need to do. But baptism doesn't solve all of our problems in life. If, if it did, we'd all get baptized. If we came out of the water and after that, everything that we dealt with was rosy from that point forward, it would be something. And everybody would line up to be baptized. My life is easier now because I'm, I'm baptized. Did, did John's life get any better after his baptism services were over? Did Jesus's life get any easier after he was baptized? Did your life get any easier after you were baptized? Now, if we're queer Christians, we're going to say, yes, it got better because I know I'm saved and there's a place for me in heaven. But did your daily life change? Did you allow it to change? Did you make it change? Jesus was taken by the Holy Spirit immediately into the wilderness for 40 days. And the question that always comes up is why? The stories about Jesus' baptism, he came out of the water and immediately the Holy Spirit whisked him away. I mean, he just transported him. Everybody's like, how can that happen? We, we see it all the time now in Star Trek and uh, uh, the Avenger movies and stuff like that, that you're in one place one time and somewhere else in another time and so on and so forth. This doesn't happen. It didn't happen. And Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, was literally taken from one place and moved to another place. Now, theologians will argue about why he went into the wilderness for 40 days. A lot of times people, when they had a major decision in their life, they went into fasting. And they went into a quiet time to where we all need some alone time. Have you ever been surrounded by so many people that you just say, I just need to step away for a few minutes. Uh, sometimes when children and grandchildren and life and everything else happens, we need some quiet time. Jesus might have been taken into the wilderness so he could have times to assess what was going to be happening to him. You have to realize Jesus knew what was going to happen to him over the next three years and what would happen to him at the end of the three years. Jesus knew that. It was part of God's plan. Jesus knew the beginning of his ministry and the end of his ministry and his ascension and everything else that went on. But Jesus needed some time to process that. But while he was in the wilderness, we know what happened. We know that Satan, one of the fallen angels, came to Jesus and, and, and wanted him to be tempted. And we know by other stories, not in Mark, but we know in by other accounts that he was tempted three different times. And Satan wanted Jesus to be a worldly power, a worldly leader, a worldly politician. That sounds awful coming from a Christian point of view. But you have to realize the Jewish people wanted it too. The Jewish people wanted Jesus to be a military ruler, a military leader that would lead the Jewish army into an undefeatable uh, battle that, that no one could, could control them over, over the years and that Jesus would be king of the world. And Satan wanted it too because he knew that, and, and many of us know that Satan's in charge of this world that uh, people will argue God's in charge of this world, but it says scripturally that Satan uh, has, has control over some of the lives in this world. And I don't think he would let, that God would let that happen if Satan wasn't one that would, would deal with it that way. But he would be tempted. Jesus would be tempted. And just because we have come out of the baptismal waters, we're going to be tempted. And the lesson talks about temptation a little bit. It doesn't talk about it a whole lot. I wish it had spent a lot more time on it, but we would run out of time tonight and today and this morning uh, when, when we talk about this. But my question to you is, we, we know Jesus was tempted. How are we tempted when we came out of the baptismal waters? What are our spiritual challenges? Um, there are folks that think a spiritual challenge for them is they are too timid and too shy to share their message with other people because some people may not like it. I, I have to admit that I am not a born salesman. 
I, I, I hate to sell a $1 raffle ticket to anybody. I just despise doing that. I have a couple of really close friends that are, are salesmen. And I, I just say that, how do you do this? And they keep saying, William, you have to go to, through the nose to get to the yeses. And I'm thinking sometimes that might be the way that we're supposed to be with talking about our spiritual leadership and our spiritual gifts that sometimes we have to go through the people that aren't going to be willing to accept it to get to the people that really, really want to accept it. And I think the world's greatest tragedy is to be able to get to heaven and think that you had had an opportunity to make a disciple out of somebody and they may be left behind because you didn't fulfill your job. And I just think that that will be it. It says, so why do we have spiritual challenges? Why does, why does God give us the challenges that we have in our lives? Shouldn't we be God's children and everything be nice and rosy as soon as, as we come up after out of the baptismal waters? Well, we ought to know better. It wasn't rosy for Jesus. Um, Jesus never had a home, never had a place to lay his head that he called his own, uh, never had a bank account. Um, needed the help of others to eat and to provide food for him. But Mark doesn't tell us a whole lot about temptation, but Jesus wanted Jesus, I mean, Satan wanted Jesus to be a worldly king. And so did the Jews, just like I've already said. Jesus sometimes fed the people, but his focus wasn't on physical needs. His focus was on their spiritual needs. Sometimes he had to feed them so he could talk to them and get them to listen. Um, but Jesus didn't put on a show, excuse me. Uh, he didn't put on a show. He delivered a message and Jesus told them what he wanted them to know. Uh, Jesus was not a political decide, Messiah and he didn't give in to the temptations of the world. Jesus knew what God wanted and his kingdom was not of this world. So a question that we have in the quarterly, and it's over on page uh, 34, and I want to read them to you because they were good, but it says, how do you handle temptation? How do you deal with temptation? Those of us, there are some people that don't deal with temptation at all. There are some people that struggle with temptation constantly. But there are six guidelines here on page 34. I just want to read them so you'll know what they say and maybe refer to them if you can get your hands on a book. But it says, keep an active prayer life. Uh, there are many of us that have a prayer life that we call on God every time we need God's help. We call on God to bless what we want to have done and what we want to do and our, our thoughts and our, our desires. But we don't pray a lot of times that God will lead us in his direction because there's a lot of times that we just as Christians don't want to go. Um, we, we don't want to do that extra step, or I would really like to stay home tonight and watch the football game and not go out and be working on somebody else's something because they need me. Uh, then it says in number two, read the Bible to discover how biblical characters dealt with temptation. Temptation is out in every scripture. And so it wants us to become as knowledgeable about that as possible. Number three, have an accountability partner or group. I was in a man's Bible study years ago for about 15 years. And there was another friend of mine in there. And we decided that we were going to be accountable to each other. And we talked about almost every week, you know, what's going on? How are you doing? How's your prayer life? What are, you, what are your struggles? And I never felt like I had anybody as close as I did uh, to that person in a prayer life for, for years and years. Uh, number four, decide ahead of time how you would respond in a temptation situation. Doesn't temptation usually hit us by sheer accident? Something comes up and we're, we're tempted. Oh, I'd really like to have that, or I want that for me, or I want that in my life. Uh, this is saying, let's, let's try to uh, have a plan of attack to avoid it before it happens. Number five says, Avoid situations that would tempt you to sin. How do we do that in the world that we live in right now? How do we avoid temptation? It's on every commercial. It's in every TV show. It's in every action we see on the street. 
It's in every conversation. How in the world, when we're bombarded constantly, do we maintain the life that, that Jesus wants us to do? And number six, know God's mission for our life and focus on it. That goes back to what I was saying at the very beginning. If our ministry started when we were baptized, do you know what your mission is? Have you focused on that? With the lessons that we've had recently, I'm trying to change my focus um, to think more in terms of being God-centered rather than just always William-centered. Mark tells us that Jesus began his ministry when John was arrested. There was a little bit of overlapping time there, but not much. Jesus preached warnings. John, excuse me, John preached warnings and to repent. Jesus preached the good news. And it says that in Mark. God was planning to save us all along, and Jesus talked about that, and the kingdom of God was invading this world, and it was happening through Jesus Christ, and Jesus was pre presenting that I have good news for you, that as bad as it's going to be in this life, in this world, there is something better, and if you make that choice, you will have it with me everlastingly, and a lot of people are still so hung up with this life, and the accountability that comes with the things that we have in our lives. Do we have enough money to retire? Do we have enough money to put our children through school? Do we have enough money to eat next week? Do we have enough of enough? And we're so busy with that that we don't always see the good news. God was planning to save us all along and the kingdom of God was invading the world. And we don't think of it like that. John said, repent and change direction put your trust in Jesus. Jesus offered salvation through believing in him. He sacrificed himself on the cross and got victory through the resurrection. Can we sacrifice ourselves uh, by not being tempted and dealing with what God wants us to do in our lives as opposed to uh, <clears throat> what we want to do and when we do that, we will know that we will have the victory uh, in everlasting life. Baptism, and I wanted to end with this, that baptism is the beginning of a new life and a new ministry. And when you're baptized, that's when the work begins. So I want to leave you with that. We're in the middle of the work beginning. And I hope that all of you will do very, very well in your ministry. Uh, this is a time when we need to ask our pastors, our friends, our Christian friends for help in discovering what our ministries are if we don't already know what they're supposed to be. Where can you plug yourself in to share your ministry, to share your faith with folks that don't know Jesus? Our ministry has begun, and God wants us to use it for his uh, kingdom so that we can take as many people as possible and not leave anyone behind. I'd like to end with that and with a closing prayer. We ask this, this morning, Jesus, we ask that will you be with us and that you give us strength and courage and that you will work with us in our ministry and that our ministry will be something that you will be proud of and not something that will make us popular but it will be able to allow us to identify with you. You wanted to be baptized so you could show us the way. We want to be baptized so we can be like you. And now we know that the ministry begins. Be with us through that ministry. Help our ministry always to be focused on you and never on ourselves. And just help us as we go through life trying to find the, the obstacles and dealing with the situations that you place in front of us and give us enough sense to know that this is an opportunity that we have to do your will. We ask all these things in your son's name. Amen. Thank you and God bless.